Well, good morning, everybody. It's sure an awesome day to be in church and not in the hospital. Huh? <laughs> Just a little reality check. We're going to jump right in because there is some place I need to get to this morning. We are in a series that's dealing with the outpouring of the glory, the moving of the Holy Spirit. Some people call it revival, however you want to look at it. We're looking at specific things concerning that. And uh, I'll just briefly say the word glory, in its simplest definition, it's when the power and the presence of God manifests in your life among us. Simple definition of the word glory. Most people want the power and the presence of God to manifest in their lives. But this is my estimate. But I think way too many of us struggle with the process needed to make that happen. There is a process to opening up ourselves and our world for God's presence and his power to manifest in it. Now, there are occasions where there's, a, there's just a sovereign move of the Spirit and God just does something because he wants to do it. But the scriptural basis is we prepare ourselves to receive. And then he honors that and he reciprocates on that. Uh, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all things will be added to you. Well, what if you don't seek it all? Well, you're probably going to miss out on some things. Because you need to open that door. Um, so there's lots of scriptures that go in that direction. So individually as well as a church, that to experience the, the outpouring, to experience the moving of the Holy Spirit in our life, to experience the glory, we need to prepare. There's a process to that. So what's the process? Let's look at a few scriptures here. But I say, walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit. Responsive to and controlled and guided by the Spirit. Then you will certainly not gratify the cravings, desires of the flesh, of the human nature. For the desires of the flesh are opposed to the Holy Spirit. Ah. So we've got a war going on right here in every one of us. The Holy Spirit's trying to accomplish something, and our old nature, our flesh, is trying to accomplish something, and they're opposites. Huh. Well, that's interesting. The desires of the flesh are opposed to the Holy Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are opposed to the flesh. The godless human nature, that's what it means by the flesh. For these are antagonistic to each other. You know what antagonistic is? It's when you're kind of going. <laughs> it's not that you just dislike somebody. It's a. Ee. I'm antagonistic against you, which means. Ee. Okay. That's how the spirit and the flesh, the fallen human nature, there's fireworks between those two. Continually withstanding and in conflict with each other so that you are not free. Oh. Huh. So this war, if it's not dealt with correctly, we end up living a Christian life where we're not free. But are prevented from doing what you desire to do. Hmm. So what do we do? Well, if you jump down a little further in that chapter, it says, now the doings, the practices of the flesh are obvious. They are clear. And then he lists them, and I didn't list them there. And then three verses further, he says, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So he, which is, and I'll finish reading it, the work which his presence within us accomplishes is, and then he lists them. I didn't list them, I just put the scriptures there. So he's trying to show how the two are opposed to each other and antagonistic to each other. If you go to verse 24 in that same chapter, just a couple verses later, and those who belong to Christ Jesus, the Messiah have crucified the flesh, the godless human nature, with its passions and appetites and desires. So to say it another way, we have the right to choose which direction we're going. Are we going after the old nature or are we going after the spirit? 
if you want to be free, you can't go after the old nature. You have to go after the spirit. And literally, this realm has to die in your life. In other words, it's not alive and active. It's crucified. The old nature side. If we live by the spirit, let us also walk by the spirit. Oh, well, I have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in me. Well, are you walking by him? In other words, every step of life you take, you're doing it by the Holy Spirit. You say, what does that have to do with anything? That's how you turn your back on the old nature and go after the spirit. You're not directed by what your body wants. You're not directed by what the old nature wants. You're directed by what the spirit wants because you're literally walking with him. If the Holy Spirit, if by the Holy Spirit we have our life in God, let us go forward walking in line. Wow. So it's not just going his direction. It's, come on, get in line. Follow me. Our conduct, you say, what does that mean to get in line? Our conduct controlled by the Spirit. That's what it means. So we've got this war thing we're dealing with. And I'm going to show you a bit here. I, I showed you the scripture last Sunday uh, that whenever you find the word glory, most of the time in the New Testament, someplace in the context, you'll either find the word suffering or you'll find the description of suffering. And the true suffering of that, we'll hit the scripture again this morning, is in 1 Peter 4. The only true suffering God wants us to go through is, is making this choice to turn away from the human nature all the desires of your flesh and go that way. Follow the Spirit. Get in line. Let Him control you. Could you bring up uh, Galatians 5.19? It's not in the PowerPoint. If you could switch over there, bring it up. I just feel like the Holy Spirit's saying... Point out what it looks like to follow the old nature. Show what Paul said. These are some of the characteristics. Galatians 5 verse 19. Oh, you're there fast. Now the doings, the practices of the flesh. So this is what it's like to go after the flesh. They're clear. They're obvious. They're immorality. Impurity. Impurity can be in your speech. It can be jokes. It can be all kinds of stuff. Indecency. There are some things that God considers decent and some things he doesn't. Right. You say, well, what do you, what's, what's decent? Well, you got to get in the word and find out. You got to let the Holy Spirit lead you. But not everything that comes out of a human being, God likes. Right. He loves us. But it, it's like your two-year-old. When they're just learning how to eat in their high chair. You love them. But this thing of taking the tray and the cup <laughs> and dumping it over the edge, it's like that's indecent. We don't love that, but we love them. Well, that's the same thing with us. Go to the next verse if you would. Idolatry. That's, idolatry in the Old Testament is described as stubbornness. Witchcraft. Witchcraft. Uh, um, Rebellion is as witchcraft, witchcraft as rebellion. Idolatry is as stubbornness. God doesn't like stubbornness in us. Now, if you go to James 3, it says following the Spirit, we are open to change. We're open to being taught. We're open to being guided. The old nature gets stubborn. Don't tell me what to do. I've been doing this for 53 years. Who are you? I was doing this before you were ever born. Oh, you stubborn thing, you. You got so hard in your ways, you can't even learn something new. Maybe they got a point. That's a, that's a flesh thing, old nature thing. Sorcery. Sorcery in its truest is not demon worship, it's drugs. Go to the book of Revelation, it describes that. Drugs are not of the Holy Spirit. Drugs, you know, we're talking illegal drugs. We're talking drugs that... We get hooked on we can't get away from. They're, they're sorcery. It's, that's of the flesh. Enmity. Being enemies with people. Strife. You're just the hardest person to get along with because you're always trouble. Jealousy. Anger. Selfishness. 
Boy, selfishness. Today, selfishness. In our society, I mean, it's always been a problem. But in our society, it's like, wow, could make a series out of that one word. Divisions, the party spirit. Woohoo! Thank God it's Friday. Why? Sunday's church. Can't wait to go. <laughs> That's not what they're meaning when they say TGIF. Thank God it's Friday. They have no, they're, they're going to sleep in on Sunday from their hangover. Party spirit. That whole thing is not of God, it's of the flesh. It's of the old nature. And Paul just wanted to point a few of these things out to us. So when we say, well, I, I don't understand fully what he's talking about. Well, he pointed a few things out and he said, they're obvious. They're not God. Now, here's the kicker. You can't be living in the obvious things that are not God and having the glory of God manifesting in your life. The Spirit of God, who is responsible for manifesting the power and the presence of God in our life, hates that. And he's not going to co-mingle with it. There's a separation that has to take place. That's why Paul said, crucify that. Make that die. Quit it. Repent means to turn 180 degrees. Turn away from that. Get in line and walk with the Holy Spirit. Be controlled by him and forget about that life. Go this way. Now the glory can manifest. You're, you've postured yourself to do that. That brings up the word which was the title to the message, suffering before the glory. Because here's what's real. Our old nature, our flesh, likes our sin. Let's just call it what it is. We like it. That's why we go back to it. Peter said it's like a dog going back to its vomit. That's God's perspective. When he watches us go back to our sin, it's like, ew, how can you eat that? Yuck. And then here's the grossest thing. The dog just gets done cleaning it up. And then they come and want to lick you. <laughs> okay. Now take that picture. You just got done messing around in what you like. And then you go to God. And he's going, yuck. I don't want what your tongue just touched touching me. The hardest part is we enjoy that. And scripture says it will call, cause suffering in our flesh to turn our back on that and walk away. But that's what's necessary to get in step with the Holy Spirit. So we had two questions come in last Sunday that were really good questions that I really felt we need to sit on and deal with. I'm going to deal with one this morning. It's a two-part question because it goes exactly with what we were talking about last Sunday. So let me go back to what we ended with. In the Bible, in the New Testament, now we are in the New Covenant. We're not in the Old. We're in the New Covenant. There's lots of good things in the Old Covenant, but I am not under that covenant. I'm under the New Covenant. Amen. And Jesus set that one to the side. Okay, so I'm under this one. Under the New Covenant, there is nothing in the Bible that says cancer, heart disease, migraine headaches like we had this morning dealt with, um, diabetes, you just go on listing, kidney failure, whatever. None of that is suffering for the glory of God in the New Testament. The glory of God manifests when those things try to happen in our body and by his power, he heals us of it and gets us free of it. That's the glory of God in the New Testament. The church, however, and I can tell you why, and we're going to deal with it a little later. The church, however, by the church, I mean traditional religion in the United States. The traditional established church has taught us that some of these things in our life are to bring God glory. And we're just supposed to suffer under them. And that's suffering for God. 
If you can show me scripture on that, I'm with you. But you won't. You can't because it's not in the New Testament. You say, well, the Old Testament. I don't live in the Old Testament. I live in the New Testament. When Jesus came, this might be a revelation. When Jesus came, things changed. You know, just, just in case you missed that part. When you're done with Malachi and you start in Matthew, you're going into a whole new program. Things changed. It's not in the New Testament that we're supposed to physically suffer, mentally, emotionally suffer for God. It's not there. But do you know why that got into the church? It's very simple. The church didn't have the answer, which is the presence and the power of God manifesting and healing us. And the church had more and more and more sick, dying people suffering. And the prayer didn't work. So we changed the prayer to, Lord, whatever your will is in their life, we just accept your will. Well, why don't you go read the New Testament? It, it is the last will and testament. It says it on the first page. Now you know what his will is. But we changed the prayer so that we could change our theology. What's the theology? What I just described. Well, some people, God just picks them to carry a heavy load and burden in life. And I know you're really struggling with dementia. But it could be God's will for you. Now, here's the problem. You entertain that thought. You no longer have faith to believe for God to heal you. Because if it's, maybe this is God, maybe this is not God. Hebrews 11, 1 says, faith is being sure. If you're, well, maybe this is God, maybe this is not God in my life. You're not sure, and you can pray till you're blue in the face. You probably won't get nothing. So then we pray, oh, Lord, whatever your will is. If you want me to die of dementia, then all glory be to you. Dying of dementia brings no glory to God because God receives glory when his power and presence manifests. And when his power and presence manifests, what's ever broken in the brain gets healed. Amen. So here was the question. <clears throat> it's a two-parter. So how does this fit the refining fire? This being the true suffering of 1 Peter 4 is, is dying to our flesh. It's not sickness, disease, accidents, um, being backed over by a semi, you know. And stuff like that happens. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It happens. But that doesn't, that doesn't make it God's will. It wasn't his idea. And the second part of the question is, does God use sickness and accidents and other hardships as these refining fires? Excellent question. You say, why is that such an excellent question? Because most churches in America believe that. God uses sickness and accidents and all kinds of hardships, suffering for Jesus. Got in a head-on accident. Now I'm paralyzed from my waist down. Praise be to God. It's like, who? What? But most churches teach that. So, Excellent question, because I don't buy that. 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's look at what this refining fire thing is all about, and I'm getting a running start on it here. Verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us a new birth into a living hope. That's a whole thing right there, living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And into an inheritance... That can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. Who through faith are shielded by God's power. Until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So we've been given a new birth into a living hope. 
we have an inheritance coming. And while we're here, through faith, we are shielded by God's power. That shield will work to whatever depth you believe it'll work. That's all by faith. If you believe God will shield you and keep you healthy, you are shielded. If you don't believe any of that stuff, you just believe that you're saved and going to go to heaven. Well, he's going to shield that part of you then. It's we, Jesus said it this way, according to the way you measure, it'll be measured to you. So we're the ones who decide this. Verse number six. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Oh, well, there it is. Suffering because of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire. So there is the question. Could it be these trials are refining our faith by fire? Well, it's not could be. They are question is what are the trials it's not whether trials refine our faith it's what are the trials now i'm going to stop here and i'm going to interject something because i probably won't come back to it so you'll log it in your mind and when we get there you'll remember it and where we're going you've had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials these have come so that your faith Skip how he describes it there. These have come so that your faith may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Apply that to what's going on in America. Because when you hear what these people were facing as trials, it makes you go, oh, dear Jesus. So just keep that in mind. They were going through trials to fix their faith. Wait until you hear what the trials were. And it wasn't that somebody got run over by a donkey. <laughs> Broke their leg. That's not it. Read on. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, which is the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke in the in, of the grace that was come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances in which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing. Now, notice this last line. When he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Suffering before the glory. It's a theme in the New Testament. So he's saying, yeah, you've got trials and they're rough. But the reason for the trials is to affect your faith. Okay. So now we're going to go to 1 Peter 4 and we'll read the scripture that I, I gave you last Sunday. Read it again. This is God's perspective on suffering. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. Because he who has suffered in his body has obviously gotten cancer or a brain tumor or heart disease or had a head-on collision and their legs broken or all the things that we put in there for suffering in religion. But the Bible doesn't say that. You know what it says? He who has suffered in his body is done with sin. True suffering is to say no. I'm not doing that anymore. This desire, this craving for the stuff that's not of God, no. Just try it and see how good that feels. <laughs> it only takes a matter of time and it's like your flesh begins salabidating. Oh, I want it. I've got to have it. You wake up at night thinking about it. No, I am not going to eat chocolate cake. You'll wake up in the middle of the night. Oh, that's all flesh. Say no to it. Oh, it's hard. That's right. It's called suffering. It is hard. No matter what it is, it's hard. But the result of it is he does not live the rest of his earthly life for those human desires. 
He doesn't do the old nature thing, but for the will of God, which is the Holy Spirit thing. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what the pagans do. Whoa. So he's saying, if we just kind of go along with our flesh, we're like pagans. A pagan is a person that's godless. He says, you're just like pagans. Living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, detestable idolatry. Let me give you just one thought on idolatry. He calls it detestable idolatry here in the NIV. Idolatry. Years ago, back in Colorado, we had somebody get saved, and man, they started growing, going after God. And took them maybe, I'm going to say, it was a few years. And all of a sudden, they came to us with a question. And they said, is there anything wrong with Marilyn Monroe? And I'm going, I never met her. I don't know. <laughs> Marilyn Monroe, that's an odd question. I said, why do you ask? Well, because I have always thought Marilyn Monroe was the absolute greatest epitome of what a woman should be. And I have all her posters and all the paraphernalia, everything I can find is plastered in my walls at home. And for some odd reason, it feels like the Holy Spirit saying, I need to take all that stuff down, get rid of it. <laughs> you think? <laughs> I said, well, I'd like to see it. Now remember, she's growing, so she's learning this. I said, well, I'd like to see this. So Mary and I went over. She wasn't kidding. Man, instead of pictures on the walls, Marilyn Monroe. Huge, life-size posters and paraphernalia. And she had been collecting. She probably spent thousands of dollars on this stuff. She said, why would the Holy Spirit want me to get rid of that? Because he doesn't want you looking at a person to follow. He wants you looking at him to follow. And when you have choices to make, you don't want to make them like Marilyn Monroe would have made them. You want to make them like the Holy Spirit asks you to make them. And it's just like you hit her on the head with a two by four. She just went, oh. And then her face went red. And I think it was anger. She said, I got to get rid of this stuff, don't I? That was the suffering. She just computed all the money she spent on it. She just put together how she lived her life on the basis of how this woman was. And God's asking her to make a choice. Let go of this. Come follow me. And her flesh is going, yeah, I don't want to do that. But as a result, verse 2, if we do that, we don't live our life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. Mm -hmm. It goes on, we won't read anymore. A little further down in the chapter, verse number 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice. See, so we're, Peter is writing the entire first book of Peter to a people who are in immense suffering. And he's trying to give them a godly perspective on it. And he's hitting it. He started the book in chapter one with it. We're in chapter four now. He's hitting it again. He said, I know you're suffering, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. Notice sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Suffering before the glory. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. And the spirit of glory and God rests on you. And then he talks about if you suffer, it should not be like a murderer or a thief. I mean, don't do something wrong so that they end up grabbing you and throwing you in jail. And now you think you're suffering for Jesus. Verse number 16. However, if you suffer as a Christian, and what does that suffering look like? Well, he just described it at the beginning of the chapter. It's to be done with sin. It is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. So he's saying, we got to learn how to do this as Christians or how in the world are newly saved or even unsaved going to get the concept if we can't even get it. Verse 19, so then who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faith creator and continue to do good. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder 
And the only reason I put this in is watch what he says. A witness of Christ's sufferings. He said, yeah, I've suffered. I know what this is like. And the one who will share in the glory to be revealed. Suffering before the glory, there it is again. So what was happening with them? Well, let's show you. And this is the source I'm using. Could have used any of them. They all say the same thing, but this is the source I'm using. I'm just going to read this. It wasn't a bunch of disease. It wasn't a bunch of sickness. It wasn't a bunch of accidents, calamities. It, it wasn't that realm at all. Here's what it was. Oops. Jumped ahead. My iPad jumped ahead. Let me find where I was at. And we'll go there. Okay. Wow, it did jump ahead. Here it is. All right, I'm back. Technology. First Peter 1, here's the introduction to the book out of that source. A fire devastated Rome in AD 64, but suspiciously left unscathed the estates of Nero and his older boyfriend. Oh, whatever his name was. Like any good politician, Nero needed a scapegoat for his ills in what appeared to be a new religion, understood as a fanatical form of Judaism, which was Christianity, begun by an executed teacher three and a half decades before, Jesus, that's Jesus, filled the need perfectly. Romans viewed Christians, like Jews, as antisocial. Certain charges became so common that they were stereotypical by the second century. Romans viewed Christians as atheists, like philosophers for rejecting the gods, cannibals for claiming to eat Jesus' body and drink his blood, and incestuous for statements like, I love you, brother, or I love you, sister. Well, that's kind of funny. He's living with his boyfriend, and now they're accusing us of that. <laughs> Judaism was a poor target for outright persecution because its adherents were so numerous and it was popular in some circles. Further, Nero's mistress, oh, so he had a boyfriend and a mistress. Whatever her name, Sabina, was a patron of the Jewish causes, so he didn't want to go after the Jews because he'd get her mad. By contrast, Christianity was viewed as a form of Judaism whose support was tenuous even in Jewish circles. Jews weren't crazy about Christianity. And therefore, it offered an awesome scapegoat. According to the early second century historian, Tacitus, who disliked Christians himself, according to his records, Nero burned Christians alive as torches to light his gardens at night. You light them up, however long they burn, they burn. Once they go dark, you pull them out and put a new one in. We got to keep light in the garden. He killed other Christians in equally severe ways feeding them to wild animals for public entertainment. In all, he may have murdered thousands of Rome's Christians, although most Christians there escaped his grasp. Thus, even though the Greek part of the empire loved Nero, Christians saw him as a prototype of the Antichrist. Nero died in disgrace several years later, pursued by fellow Romans who hated him. So they were not suffering what America says is suffering, or the church says is suffering, they were suffering under the hand of Rome and being martyred. Oh, now when you go back and read those scriptures we just gave you, they're going to look totally different. So the question was, so how does this fit into the refining fire? Does God use sickness, accidents, and other hardship in these refining fires? Well, according to 1 Peter 1, 7, which we read, the focus of refining fire is to purify our faith. The focus by God in this situation, the Roman persecution we just read about, was not physical ailment. It was that their faith wouldn't fail in the middle of persecution and martyrdom. I mean, if you're three people back and they just took one out to light the garden and he just burned out and now they're taking the one in front of you out and you know you're next in line and the guard just comes up to you and says, hey man, we knew each other. I like you. Just deny this Jesus thing and you don't have to do this. You know what's Peter saying? 
Don't let your faith fail. Do not turn your back on Jesus. You know, the greatest suffering, and this may seem odd, but from God's perspective, the greatest suffering at that moment would not be to burn. The greatest suffering at that moment would be to say no to your flesh, which is screaming, I don't want to do this. I'm not going that way. I'm not going to deny Christ. So now take that whole thought and put it back into our political system and where this thing is going in America and how weak and compromised and cowardly the Christian church is in America. Peter said the reason for this is to refine your faith by that fire. And my first thought is, oh God, don't let us go there. Because the America's Christians need their faith refined. But I don't want to do it under the same thought of how Rome was doing it. And we're the source or the, or the focus of persecution. Second part of the question was, does God use sickness, accidents, and other hardships as the refiner's fire? There's no New Testament indication he does that. However, there is one thing, and this is what I needed to get to. Well, let me just make this statement and then we'll get to it. However, there is New Testament evidence that God will use those kind of things in judgment. Just go to the book of Revelation. The good part is, we're not in the book of Revelation. <laughs> we're not there yet. But when God starts judging this earth, specifically the nations of this world in the book of Revelation, there's some nasty things going to come down. Judgment. But we're not in judgment. And I prefer not to go there before we have to. Okay? So there is another aspect, and here's the point I really want to make this morning. There's another aspect to our struggling with sickness or disease and not getting answers to our prayer, no matter what they might be, that God does do. And I'm going to go back and review something we talked about a while back, but it, it fits right in here, and I just felt it needed to be put here to answer that question. Does God use sickness, disease, accidents, and stuff like that, hardship to refine us? When God disciplines us, things bad tend to happen. Not because God is making them happen, but because the manifest power and presence of God is here, and we're living our life over here. So we're not in touch with it. So it doesn't get on us and help us. We're not in line walking with the Holy Spirit, letting him control us. We're over here with the old nature, letting it control us. God will only let a Christian do that so long and he'll discipline you. You say, well, what in the world does that look like? Well, let's talk about it a little bit because it fits in here. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 6. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves. Are you loved? It means you're going to be disciplined. What it says. You know, the, the, some of these choruses, we need to add a verse to them. You know, we're so loved by God. God is such a loving God. Well, we need to add on what it says happens when you're loved. And God's going to discipline me and it's going to be great. <laughs> Don't just pick out the phrases you like. You got to go with the whole verse. You know, verse seven, endure hardship. Hardship as is not in the original. So that's why I put it in brackets there. You just take that out because it's not in the original and most translations leave it out. NIV puts it in. I just put it in brackets. Endure discipline is the way it reads. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, you don't get out of it. Then you, if you are not disciplined, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. So an illegitimate child, that comes, the, the, the basis for that comes out of Deuteronomy 23.3. 3. 
And the comparison here is, if God would leave you undisciplined, he's treating you like an illegitimate child. He wants to discipline you. And he goes on and talks about it in there. If you refuse God's discipline, well, then you're going to be treated like an illegitimate child. Well, what's the picture? You're over here messing around with the flesh and the old nature, and you're just plain not following God because you like this. You like your sin. We all do. And God has been telling you, come on. And he's working on you, trying to get you to repent and go the other way. And you're just not doing it. Well, now he's going to have to deal with you. He ain't going to let you sit there like that any more than you'd let your own child who's doing something that's going to destroy them. Well, it's their choice. They're 13 now. Let them do what they want. No, he's not going to, you're not going to do that. If you're a good parent, you're going to discipline them. Do something to try to get them to turn. So it comes out of Deuteronomy 23.3. It's a New Testament concept, so it came through the cross. Illegitimate children were called Mamzer, M-A-M-Z-E-R, and I'll just give you the brief definition of it. It was a child that was the product of an adulterous or incestuous union. It also included the Samaritans, half Jews, half Gentiles. They were considered illegitimate to the Jewish mind. I don't think they were considered illegitimate in God's mind because they could get saved just like anybody else. But in the Jewish mind, they were thrown in with that. So an adulterous or incestuous union or a Jew married a Gentile, their children would be considered mamzers is what the word is. There was three things that happened with them. Oop, let me move on. There it is. They cannot marry someone who is an Israelite. The children of an illegitimate person also could not marry into the congregation of Israel for 10 generations. And they could not hold public office as an elder, judge, magistrate, priest, or other official in Israel. These still hold in conservative, conservative Judaism. These still hold today. The issue is, well, we're not Jews. So how does this affect the church? <clears throat> Because by saying he considers us a mamzer, if we don't come under his discipline, he's giving us a word picture here. So what are the consequences? Well, of the three, the only two that I think apply are number one and number three. The number two, I can't see how that applies in the New Testament at all. Number one, you cannot marry someone who's an Israelite. Well, the marriage supper of the lamb, we're the bride. Does it apply there? And I won't go into it, but I'm going to let you think about it. In other words, you're stubborn. You're disobedient. You're not coming under God's discipline. You're just doing your own thing over here. You refuse to repent. Well, are you without spot and wrinkle and blemish, according to what Paul said at that point? Maybe it's going to affect our resurrection. Just saying, because the one we're marrying is Jesus. And newsflash, he's an Israelite. Number two, I don't think applies. Let me jump ahead here in my, there's the first one. New Testament, only marriage in the kingdom. It's our marriage to Jesus. That's a New Testament concept. Number two, based on new covenant setup, I'm not sure this applies. I can't see how it applies. So that would have been an Old Testament thing only. Number three, they could not hold public office as an elder, judge, magistrate, priest, or other official in Israel. In the New Testament, we are to rule and reign. The second Adam, which was Jesus, came back or came and bought back for us what the first Adam lost. The first Adam was given the ability to rule, reign, subdue, repopulate, replenish, do the earth. It's your baby. You rule it. He lost that. He gave that away. Jesus came and bought it back and he handed it back to us. He said, now do it. Rule and reign this earth righteously. So again, I just reiterate something. How can you take that and separate that from our civil, social involvement in this world when the reason the righteous are here is to rule the world? 
How can you separate that? Well, see, the church should just talk about the Bible and never about anything out there. Well, if all we did was live in here, that would make sense. I actually leave the building. <laughs> I'm living out there. And the reason we find things out here is so we go out there and do a better job of how we're living out there. So they're married. I mean, our life in this world is married to our spirituality. You can't separate them. You can tell I'm aggravated. Anyway, in the New Testament, the only ruling and reigning we're told, we are told to be involved in has to do with establishing the kingdom of God on this earth. If this is the correct application of that picture of Mamzer in Hebrews 12, it explains a lot to me why many times we as Christians don't, our, our life becomes powerless. We don't get answers to prayer. We don't get our healings. We don't, we don't get the things we're after. Why? Because holding public office elder, judge, magistrate, that is a picture of a ruler. God wants us to rule in our lives. The people that were mamzers or illegitimate were not allowed to rule. So if we as Christians, by our own stubbornness or refusal to follow the spirit, live over here messing around in the flesh and the old nature, and we just are not waking up to God tenderly touching us and saying, come on. And he's convicting us. He's trying to convince us. Get away from that. No, nah, we're just like a pig at the trough, man. We're just here wallowing and having a good time. He will discipline us. And that explains or describes one of the forms of discipline. I'm not going to let you rule and reign when you're over there with the pigs. Say, so what does that mean? That's why when you pray, nothing happens. Because when we pray, it's the presence and power of the Holy Spirit working through us that makes things happen. The presence and the power of the Holy Spirit is what gives us the ability to rule and reign. If we're over here and he says, as long as you're over here and you're not going to change the way you're doing things, I'm not going to let you rule and reign. Guess what? We're without the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Not saying we're unsaved yet. Not saying that. I'm just saying he took the keys to the car away. Because instead of being home at 11, you showed up at 2 in the morning. And then the next morning, rather than using some sense, because you think you know it all, he said, why were you out till 2 in the morning? You said, I can be out as late as I want to. And he said, you just lost the car. <laughs> I can live in sin as much as I want to. And he said, then you're not going to rule and reign in my kingdom. What does that mean? You go ahead and pray. I'm not backing you up. We need some repentance here. And we need to change our ways. Then I'll back you up. But since we like to live here, then the church has just coddled that. Well, it must be God's will that this doesn't happen. You know, we prayed, if it be thy will. Why are you praying if it be thy will? Don't you know what his will is? Get in the word, figure it out. Now pray his will. But see, that's all to cover the good old boys club, the good old girls club. We're over here, pig at the trough, living there. And God said, I'm taking the keys away. Till you get on track and get in line, I'm taking the keys away. I love you, but I'm taking the keys away. Well, we got to make an excuse why the power is gone. So the excuse is, well, it's got to be God's will. No, it's not in scripture. What happens is for the illegitimate son or the mams or the supernatural, the promises don't work. Let's see where we're at here. There's the word picture for it. And these are all on the PowerPoint if you, if you need them. You can look them up and there explains what I just said. 
So going back to the question, does God use sickness, accidents, other hardships as refining fires? God, according to his word, doesn't cause them. But here is the key to the whole thing. We read it in 1 Peter, 1st chapter. We have the inheritance. We have the promises. We're supposed to be living in them. When they don't work, that is supposed to be an attention getter for us. I prayed for my sick child yesterday, and today that child is still sick. Nothing happened. Well, maybe you need a rhema word from God. Maybe you need to get in the word. Maybe you need to get in prayer. Maybe you, you need to hear something from heaven as to what to address. Go after that first. But if you exhaust every avenue you know to do as a, as a Christian, and prayers are still not happening, you need to ask yourself, am I under discipline? because he might have taken the keys away from you why because he's mean he's trying to get your attention like you are with your teenager who was doing their own thing and hopefully if i take the key if i take your power away it's going to shock you so strongly that it's like scripture says it's supposed to work. I know this is supposed to work. God promised me this is supposed to work. Why is this not working? That should be the response. This has to work. What's wrong here? Yeah. You know what the church has done with it? Oh, it's not working? Well, God is sovereign. It might be his will. You know what that does? It takes all responsibility off of us. And the whole principle of the illegitimate child is gone. Can't even use it. Because that principle works on the understanding that when we pray, things are supposed to happen. When they're not happening, something's wrong. Either I don't understand this thoroughly enough yet. God's trying to teach me something scripturally. He's trying to uh, up me in the realm of, of revelation, realm of knowledge, something. It could be all that realm or it could be. Did I do something to make him take the keys away? And now he's angry a little bit with my behavior. Loves me, but he just isn't going to do any more of this dumping the juice and the stuff over the tray and laughing about it. He's done with that. And we actually stop and do what 1 Corinthians 11 says after he talks about communion. The next verse is, we examine ourselves. And go, am I off someplace? God, am I in disobedience someplace? Did you tell me to do something I'm not doing? Or did you tell me not to do something? Stop it. And I'm still doing it. What is this? Why is the power not working? In the discipline situation, the thing that is happening, not getting the answer, is supposed to get our attention. That is the illegitimate son picture. Unfortunately, I can give you more examples than we have time for this morning from my own personal life. Once I recognize this. It took me a while to recognize it. But I feel okay with that because I finally saw it. So let me give you one quick example. And this, is, this was when I was in the learning process of this. <clears throat> um, hadn't got it down yet. I was just learning it and I was going, oh, okay. God's trying to teach me something here. So I'll give you the example. Mary was pregnant with Jess. <clears throat> For those of you there, Wednesday night, here's another piece of that story I shared on Wednesday night. Tuesday night, my mistake. Mary was pregnant with Jess, and um, we were poor as church mouse for various reasons. 
And this mouse happened to be living in a church that they never used anymore, so there wasn't even breadcrumbs on the floor. So this guy was hurting really bad. So we didn't go to a doctor when Mary was pregnant with Jess. Period. We went after he was born. Because we had no health insurance. And it would take too long to explain that whole story. So won't go there. So she's in her last month. And she starts getting sick. Now remember, Jess was huge. This was kind of a living on the edge thing to begin with. Because when he was born, he was 11 pounds, 23 inches. Um, big boy. And so she, I believe, I think she told me she was 52 inches around before she dropped. Tape measure. He was a big boy. So here we are. <clears throat> She's in her last month. She starts getting sick. This happened on a Thursday. My memory says. She starts getting sick. And she gets sicker and sicker, starts throwing up, uh, starts getting weak, starts getting dizzy. Um, by Friday noon, she couldn't stay on her feet anymore. And all those of you out there who identify as guys, I have to say that nowadays, <laughs> you don't have health insurance, you're poor already, and all you can see is dollar signs flying. If we go to the doctor, if we go to the emergency room, if they're going to stick her in the hospital, this is going to be from bad to worse. You know, that, that's a guy's thinking. Right. Oh, you sit there and look so innocent. <laughs> that's a guy's thinking. All right, I'll take you off the hook. I'll just move on. <laughs> By Friday evening, she is in extreme pain in her I don't know if it's the baby, don't know if she's got the flu, don't know what she's got. And she didn't want to go any more than I wanted her to go. And once the daycare kids were all gone, then she was laying on the couch and she told me, she said, I really hate to say this to you. I said, she said, but if something doesn't change pretty quick, you better get me to the hospital. So he said, can you give me 30 minutes? Give me 30 minutes. And if it doesn't change, we'll do whatever we have to do. I'll do it. He said, why did you want 30 minutes? Because I had been praying. I had been confessing. I had been claiming the promises. I had been taking authority over any demonic activity. I was beating on every door and wall I knew to beat on. Nothing. I didn't know this principle. God's standing there with the keys. Come on, buddy. Just wake up. And I'll give them back. And you can rule and reign this situation with her. I didn't know that principle. So I'm just... It's got to be a lack of faith. It's got to be something with me. I don't get it. The promises are true. I'm not going to back off on that. So she said, okay, 30 minutes. So I went off. We had our office in our homes. So I went off in the office. And I no more than knelt down and this vague thought floated through my mind. I said, God, what is it? A little thought floats, you know, floats through. And the first thing I did is, I bind that in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I thought it was a demonic thought. It was God. And I prayed and I, God, what do I, and here we're coming up at the end of the 30 minutes. I said, God, if you don't do something, I'm going to go out and I'm going to pray for it one more time. And I'm expecting you to step in because it's my inheritance. It's my right. And that vague thought went through my mind again, just as I was leaving the office. So I went down, sat on the floor by the couch fire, and she said, did he say anything to you? I said, I don't think so. I had one thought. 
She said, well, what was the thought? Remember, I think it was two or three weeks earlier. Now, this might be a shock to you. Remember when we got in a fight? You know, we have to learn and grow just like all of you do. And we had gotten in a fight. And being from good German heritage, I was kind of mean to her. And at this point, if I'd say, give me a show of hands who are Germans, you guys are all going to sit on them. I was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. So this is your issue, Pastor. All right. I had been kind of mean to her. And I said, the only thing that went through my mind is what I did back there was wrong and God is done with that now. And I need to ask you to forgive me. I said, I don't... You know, I'm still full of myself. Demonic. I yeah. think God. Well, looking back, it's like, how obvious was that? That was God, you know. But anyway, so I looked at her and I said, well, you know, I, I don't understand it all. We haven't figured it all out yet. But I'll say this. I'm sorry for what I said and how I treated you. Forgive me. Just how I said it. Sorry for how I treated you. What I said. Just forgive me. And I'm sitting, she's laying on the couch, I'm sitting on the couch facing this way. And all of a sudden I feel this hand, bam, grabs me and squeezes me. I thought, here we go, she's dying, you know. Grabs me and squeezes me. She said, it's gone. I said, what's gone? That shows how much faith I was really in. I said, what's gone? She says, the pain, it's gone. I whip around, look at her. She says, help me up. I said, no, stay laying right there. Don't move. Whatever you're doing is working. <laughs> Don't move. She says, no, I want to get up. Got her in a sitting position. She said, it's gone. I want to stand. I said, you're too weak to stand. I want to stand. You know, Mary. <laughs> Got her up on her feet. She starts walking around the family room. She says, it's gone. My strength's back. She says, I don't feel a thing. I never prayed for her. He was waiting for me to get out of the pig trough and follow what the spirit was saying. Quit acting like you're acting with her and apologize for what you did if you'll do that son here are the keys you'll rule and reign this see i could have got stubborn i could have got proud but i was too desperate i could have said forget this jack she's the idiot not me what we fought about is her fault you know where that would have went God would have took the keys, put them back in his pocket, and said, well, you ain't learned yet. But when I obeyed, the power, the presence manifested without me saying a thing. He was wanting to manifest more than I wanted him to. And he just needed the room to do it. So, folks, I go back again to it. It's still on my heart. I go back again to what I said last Sunday. I felt like the Lord told me, some of you, because of the wrong teaching, you've struggled with things of God. You're hurt. You feel distrusting of God. You're angry with God. You've pulled back from God. And he says, they, they need to understand this isn't me. I wasn't behind this. And if they'll just forgive me for what they think I did, just clean this up, quit holding it against me, things can open up in their life. I think that's still valid this morning. <laughs> because I didn't feel peace last Sunday, and one of our elders came to me afterwards. He said, do you think everybody went up there was supposed to go up there? I said, nope. He said, I don't either. I just had the feeling that they didn't. You need to get that cleared up between you and God and quit blaming God for whatever happened to your grandma or your parents or your child or whatever. That was not God making them sick, killing them, whatever happened. That was not God. 
and I don't ascribe to this philosophy that says, we'll give them a child, and when they're three years old, we'll remember we needed another angel in heaven, so we're going to take them away. I don't ascribe to that. My God is not that confused, and he's not that short-sighted. That's not how he operates. But he gets the blame, because we don't get it. So some of us need to one-on-one -on -one with him say, God, I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I need a new understanding on this, and I'm, I've been holding the grudge here, and I'm going to let it go. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that this morning. And number two, in a group this size, there's, an, there's a number of people here who are under God's discipline. It's just he loves you. And for us to say, there is no area in my life whatsoever I have held out on him. I'm little miss goody two shoes and I do everything God wants me to do without question. <laughs> right. There's nobody here. And some of us have eaten here long enough that he said, I could take your keys away. And our prayers don't work very well. We get very few answers to prayer. Stuff we, we honestly thought the word promised us. It's like it never happens. It's just this thing is lifeless. It's powerless. He's saying fix that. The keys are jingling. Fix that. I'll drop them right back on you. And when you pray, heaven and earth will move for you. But fix that. You say, well, I can't think of what it could be. Well, I couldn't either. Sometimes we actually have to show some effort and go there and stay there saying, did I do anything? And don't disregard the slightest thoughts. They can take you someplace. But sometimes we need to go there until he gives us clearance. No, this is not the problem. You're not under discipline. Sometimes we need to go there because every way a man's ways are righteous in his own thinking, his own eyes. We all think we're squeaky clean. But if the power is not working, the promises are not working, something's wrong. And for some of us sitting here this morning, you're under discipline like I've been under discipline in my lifetime. What do you do with it? Acknowledge, you know, it's not working for me, and I'm going to go and see if I can find out. And you know, the good news there is, if you need wisdom, just ask. He'll give it to you. My sheep hear my voice. And we're going to end this service, and if you need to go, feel free to go. Just do it quietly. We're going to end the service by playing a, a song that kind of goes in the thought of, it's got to be more God and less of me. It's got to be more going that way and less going this way until I'm done going this way and I'm going this way. And as this song plays, I invite you to come to the front. Kneel down, lay down, stand, do whatever you want. Do something with your physical body other than sit there. That shows God, that's me. I'm checking on this. I need to hear from you. And spend some time in God's presence. Because I can't give you your answer. But I know who can. So Lord we pray and we ask that by your spirit. Take this now where you want it to go with us as your people. Do with us what you want done. You're the master. I'm not. You're the counselor. I'm not. So I'm asking you to speak to your people now. In Jesus name.